Churches of Christ present Speaking the Truth in Love, a program bringing you life's answers from the Word of God. Speaking the Truth in Love is presented to you by the Churches of Christ, or a number of them, in this area, in the KAIT uh, viewing area. And each of those congregations extends to you a warm welcome and invites you to come and visit with them, study with them about the great salvation that Jesus Christ made available to all of us. And if you have any questions about your salvation, or if you have any other Bible subject, then feel free to contact any of the Churches of Christ that are in your area. I'm Larry McFadden, and I uh, am the minister of the Hickory Ridge Church of Christ, and you're welcome, of course, to come and, and be with us if you're in that area as well. We have been talking about faith, and we have been using a listing of people of faith who are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. That's in the New Testament. But all of those people who are mentioned in that New Testament passage are from the Old Testament. In fact, they go back to the very beginning of mankind's history on the face of the earth. Why would we do that? Well, for the same reason that the Hebrew author of that sermon and letter, uh, he originally wrote to the, the Hebrew people, uh, the Jewish people, uh, used those examples. We use them for ourselves today. It's interesting that of all of the difficult times that we have in, uh, in dealing with the inspiration of Scripture and the truthfulness of the Scriptures as the Word of God, uh, all of the really difficult uh, discussions that we have with people involve typically those first 11 chapters of Genesis. They involve the creation story. They involve uh, the beginnings of mankind. They involve the flood in the day of Noah. And those are the very times from which the author of Hebrews chooses those heroes of faith, showing us in different generations, sometimes many generations apart, showing us 
how people could, according to their understanding of God, the way God had revealed Himself to them at that time, was a time in which, in a way in which they could know how to please God and what would be displeasing to God. Here we are in this generation, we have a message from God, we call it the Bible. Uh, it is the Word of God, it is given to us to use in order to find out exactly what God expects of us. Every person in, on the face of this earth, even though some want to deny it, has an innate sense that there is a higher being, that there is a Creator, one over all of us, and that somehow we need to accept that plea that He makes through so many different sources to have a relationship with Him. That relationship needs to be guided by God Himself in that He tells us what pleases Him and what does not. He has done that in His Word. It's up to us to choose whether we will make the choice to follow God's way or whether we will deny Him. And we have used examples, as did the Hebrew writer, we've used examples from that early time to show that there were people who chose to follow God, made good choices. And there were people, sadly, who chose not to follow God. They made terrible choices, and they paid the price for those choices as well. Well, so far in our study, we have uh, talked about Cain and Abel, an example of one who was not good and one who was good. Abel is the example of faith. Cain, not so much. No faith in that man. Not faith in God, at any rate. Then we talked about Enoch a man who never experienced death. He walked with God to the point that God said one day evidently just, well, come on, go on to heaven with me now, and never experienced death. At the young age of 365 years, he just went on to be with, he with God in heaven. And then we talked about Noah. And Noah is like Adam was in the beginning. Noah is the father of us all. And he's also one of those people who demonstrates what faith is. He wasn't perfect. But the Bible says he did everything that God commanded him to do. And he did it exactly the way God told him to. There's an example for you. Let's go on. The next example given in the Hebrew letter is a man named, depending on uh, whether you look at him early in life or later in life, a man named Abram or Abraham. Either name would suffice. They had similar meanings and were pronounced much the same way. But Abram, or Abraham, was a man who made a decision evidently early in his life. He came from an idolatrous area over in Mesopotamia, and the city of Ur was the city he was closest to. Um, so he's counted as being from Ur. Uh, he was from evidently a family that also chose to participate in the idolatry of those days and of that place. But Abram chose something different. He said, I believe there is one God, one creator, one being who brought all of this into being, and he's the one I choose to worship, and the one I choose to serve. God saw this in the man, and he decided to make a covenant with Abram. And part of that covenant was, I need you to separate from your family. I need you to go to a place that I'm going to give to you and to your descendants. And as that life of, of Abram's or Abraham's was uh, lived out, we find that he had that daily experience with God that calls us to point back to him today and say that he is the father of the faithful. In other words, he is the essence of what faith is all about. If there was ever a person who lived by faith, People point back to Abraham and say, there he is. As a matter of fact, Abraham was told that he would be the father of many nations. And if you stop and think about it, there are three major religions in this world today whose adherents point back to Abraham and claim him as the one who started their religion. Uh, Islam claims Abraham for their own. Judaism claims Abraham for their own. And of course, Christians do. And we know 
that he is our father because over and over in the New Testament as well as in the Old Testament, we have him used as an example. If we want to be faithful to God, if we want to understand what faith is, just look at that man's life. Did he live a perfect sinless life? No. And the Bible is very plain and straightforward in talking about the, the life that he lived and the fact that he did not always live a perfect life. He had a problem with lying to save his own skin on a couple of occasions. And he put someone else in jeopardy, his own wife, on both of those occasions just by doing that. But throughout his life, when God said, Abraham, do this, and I'm going to bless you this way, he took God at his word. He was a man of faith. Well, Hebrews chapter 11 uses three events, three examples from the life of Abraham to show us that he truly does deserve to be the one who is the, the essence of what faith is all about. Again, faith is not all about being perfectly sinless. Faith is about making the decision, even though I stumble, I'm going to do my best to please God and do what He tells me to do. Well, the first of those examples is when God called Abram to leave Ur of the Chaldees, then leave also the rest of the family as best he could when they arrived just north of the land that God said, I'm going to give to you, Abraham, and to your descendants. It's at that point that his father and, and a brother and some different folks decided that they would settle. In fact, uh, there's a whole sermon in that. They came to Haran and they settled there. So many people just settle for something less than what God has promised. And what a shame that is. Had they gone on with Abraham, they would have experienced a greater blessing than they did by settling in that place that was just part of the way to the place where God wanted Abraham to go. But here's what the story is in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. Uh, Isaac and Jacob were his son and grandson. Uh, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Now we noticed in the last lesson that each one of those people who were previously listed as people of faith did not think about getting the blessings of God just on this earth. Instead, they understood that there was a greater blessing awaiting them at the end of this life, and that greater blessing was a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. In other words, it's heaven itself. Abram, at the request of God, left his father's home. He traveled to that land that we now generally called the Holy Land. It was the land that God promised to Abram and his descendants, or at least some of his descendants, because some of them uh, were sent to other places to be away from the son of promise, uh, who was Isaac. And some of that extended family did accompany him part of the way, and then his nephew Lot accompanied him all the way into the promised land and created problems for his uncle Abraham the whole time he was there. And Lot's a story in itself. You talk about someone who made poor decisions in behalf of his family. Lot was one of those people. But that's another story altogether. So Abram was told, you go to this land and I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to make a, a, a gift of it to you and to your descendants. So uh, listen to this, if you will. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land that I will show you. And then he says, as his promise, as God's part of the covenant, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And we Christians today say thank you God for giving that promise to Abraham. 
Thank you for making a way for us through Abraham, through his line, and through uh, the blessings and the promises that you gave him. Well, Abram did have a, a, a problem, though. The problem was that when God made that blessing to him, he had no children. And he's thinking, okay, God says that this will belong to my descendants, but I have none. And it worried him because he became a man of great wealth. He became a man who was prospered by God in every possible way, flocks and herds of animals, which is a, a great way to, uh, to uh, keep your wealth in those days. If you've got a lot of sheep, you're a wealthy man. If you've got a lot of cattle, got a lot of camels, a lot of donkeys, you're a wealthy man. He had a lot of servants. Some of them evidently bought and paid for. Some of them just joined themselves to him and said, Abraham, I want to live with you. I want your protection. I want to be part of your family. And one of those people, one of his servants, he made the heir of everything he had. And he, it's kind of like he held that over God. God, you made me a promise about my descendants. Well, everything I own is will to my servant. When are these kids coming along that you've been talking to me about? And I realize that I'm kind of reading between the lines and ad-libbing a little bit there, but that's basically what's taking place. Where's the child? Well, Sarah, his wife, is also a, a part of, of this discussion, evidently. We don't have a kid, and I'm sure that worries her all along. And so she wonders, where's this child coming from? And one day she has an idea. What if you took my slave girl, Hagar is her name, she's an Egyptian, and why don't you have a child with her and that will be claimed as my child and your child as well and and that's the way God will give us the blessing and pass it on to our descendants so that did take place and as you would expect there was a whole lot of trouble over that decision that was made because there was friction between Hagar and Sarah Hagar points out the fact that, oh, I have a child for Abraham and you don't. And that household became uh, a home of misery. And not only were the two women at odds with each other, but it all came back to rest on Abraham as well because they kept bringing their issues back to him. And, of course, it was quite a miserable time. Well, you read that story for yourself in Genesis chapter 16. There's a whole lot more to that story. So... We come to the time then when God finally does tell Abram and Sarah, it's time. The child is going to be born that I promised you. That wasn't the child of promise. I'll take care of him in another place in another way. But I told you I would give you a child and I'm going to do it. And now's the time. Well, Sarah laughed at that. You know why she laughed? Because by the time she had that child, she's 90 years old. And even in that day, though people lived a little bit longer, uh, she was well past the age of childbearing, especially since the fact that she had never had a child in the first place. Hebrews 11, verses 11 and 12 say this. Here's that event, uh, the second event. By faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, because you see Abraham is 100 years old when that boy is born, came descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Imagine trying to count all of the children in any generation, especially this one, who have Abraham's DNA, physical DNA in their bodies. You just couldn't do it. There is no way. Nation after nation after nation is filled with people who are descended from Abraham. Well, they did have faith. They did trust God. And they did it in such a way that God's promises to them were being fulfilled in that one child. However, let me go back and read for you something else. Here's that third event. Is Abraham really a man of faith? Is he really going to do what God asked him to do? Is he going to be faithful or is he going to dodge whatever commands God gives if he doesn't like them? 
Hebrews chapter 11, we start in verse 17, by faith. By faith, did you hear that? By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, listen to this, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. What? That's the child that God promised him. The child is born. He's growing. He's still a boy. But God now says, okay, I'm going to give you a test. Well, he probably doesn't tell him it's a test. He just says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. It goes on to say, he who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. And this is the way it happened. God tested Abraham in an unthinkable way. Listen. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son. Now remember, we read the other from Hebrews chapter 11 looking back. But this is what we look back to in the book of Genesis. Take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, so you won't be mistaken about it. It's Isaac I'm talking about. Go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. You notice the positive thinking of this man. We're coming back, both of us. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. By the way, there are deep lessons in this story. God himself will provide the lamb for the sacrifice. Do you think about Jesus at all when you hear that? Well, when they reached the place that God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of God it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Are you thinking about yourself at all and wondering if God asked me to do something that extreme and in my mind something that terrible, would I go the other way? 
would I like Jonah did at another time, would I like Jonah want to head in a different direction when God said, I want you to go here and do this. All Jonah had to do was preach to a whole city of people. He didn't have to sacrifice his son. But Jonah said, I'm not doing that. I'm going the other direction. I'm getting away from God as quick as I can. Abraham, you noticed, as soon as God told him that, that very next morning, as soon as it's daylight, he's up cutting wood, getting things ready because he's going to do what God asked him to do. And all of the time, evidently, he's thinking in his mind, this is the son that God promised me through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Now, if he's asking me to do this, and yet he's still going to use that boy in order to give me all these blessings and all of my descendants and all the world, then that boy is coming back down the mountain with me alive. I know he is. Well, folks, that's faith. That is faith. Is there a child of yours or a grandchild of yours that if God said, I need him, I need her, I need you to sacrifice them for me. I need you to give them to me. Would you do it? And you see, God is asking something so outrageously terrible of Abraham. You and I know this is true, that there is no way Abraham would do it unless he is truly committed to God. Why is Abraham called the father of the faithful? Can't you see it? That example shines over every other example that you could possibly have. Who would trust God that much? Think about it. If you have a Bible question, would like to receive a free Bible correspondence course, would like a copy of two free books, Why I'm a Member of the Church of Christ, and Basic Bible Lessons, please contact the Nettleton Church of Christ. Speaking the Truth in Love can be viewed online. Speaking the Truth in Love is brought to you by these area churches of Christ. Jesus saves, Jesus saves.